Hi there, ladies and gentlemen of Bio 400. This is your basic biochemistry screencast session number three, and this is Mr. Workman. Uh, I'm going to go through essentially why it is that bonds can form between atoms in this particular screencast, and we're going to listen to or talk to. Um, uh, I'm going to talk to you about why different types of bonds can form between different atoms, uh, as the case may be. Um, but really to get us started here, I think it's important that you understand that bonds are either forming or are breaking um, as a result of what we call chemical reactions. When chemical reactions happen, uh, groups of atoms are going to break apart and then reform in different combinations. Um, and in order for that to happen, bonds have to be broken and formed in uh, different patterns. And when that happens, energy is either stored or released depending on the types of bonds or the numbers of bonds that are being formed or broken in a chemical reaction. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of units uh, from now. Uh, but just ha have that in your back pocket or you know, the back of your mind as you study this particular proce uh, processes. We're going to really focus again, uh, I should say, on why it is that bonds form and the t different types of bonds that we can have and why those different types of bonds can occur. Um, reactions and equations, I think what I'm going to do is save that for screencast session four, because otherwise this one will just get too long. This diagram is a nice one that's showing um, uh, a shared pair of electrons between a couple of different nuclei. And this is a nice general diagram, and I'll be talking about this again later in the session here, uh, the general difference between what we call covalent bonds and uh, ionic bonds. So there's covalent, there's ionic. So let's um, <clears throat> answer this question. Why is it that chemical bonds can form? Well, the thing you got to realize is that um, atoms, it seems, according to atomic theory, are, are most stable when their outermost energy level is filled with electrons. So, okay, what is that? Um, and how do we know whether or not that's going to happen or what that even means? Well, the first thing that you need to be able to do, and we've practiced this already, is to be able to come up with what we call a Bohr model which is just a really, really rudimentary diagram of how electrons and protons and neutrons are arranged within the structure of an atom. And you should be able to do that using information from the periodic table from, uh, for almost any element uh, up through atomic number 20 at this point. It's important that you know that this outermost energy level, okay, let me get my pen marking here, this outermost energy level is referred to as the valence shell. All right, the valence shell, the valence shell, here it is, is that outermost level. So if I'm looking at this Bohr model over here, this last level, the outermost ring, so to speak, is the valence shell, and this electron is a valence electron within that valence shell. So, um, Again, here's our really important statement. Atoms are most stable when their outermost energy level is filled with elect electrons. And if you know your rules about how many electrons are filling these different levels, um, you should know the first level, for instance, is full when it has two electrons, as is shown here. And this next level, the second level, is full when it's shown uh, when it has eight electrons. And this next level also, the third level, has room for eight electrons. So what do we have here? Well, we have one electron. Well, that's not a full energy level. That's not a full valence shell. So what that means is that this particular configuration for this atom, and I know it's sodium because the number of protons is equal to 11, I know that it's not stable. So what's this thing going to do? Um, and what do atoms tend to do in, in, in terms of increasing their stability? Well, what, what they can do is either share or transfer electrons. Uh, among nuclei. So um, we'll predict what is going to happen to an element like this um, in class and going forward here. And there's our diagram of uh, covalent bonding and ionic bonding. So we'll go into that a little bit more. So let's really start from the beginning here. How, um, how are we going to know how atoms are either going to be sharing electrons or transferring electrons, as the case may be? Well, that 
by and large depends on their structure and how many electrons are found in their outermost orbital. So let's do some drawings of Bohr models of atoms here. Helium is uh, um, right here. It's going to have a, an atomic number of two. And here's the average or the weighted average atomic mass. So from that information, what I'm going to be able to determine is that a helium atom must have two protons. And most helium atoms that exist in this universe will have two neutrons. Um, there are probably some helium atoms that have more than two neutrons in this universe because uh, the weighted average of helium uh, seems to be a little bit above four. Well, this is going to be a helium atom to start here. So what does that mean? It means that my total number of electrons are going to be equal to my total number of protons. So I'm going to have two electrons. And so I've got my two protons, I've got my two neutrons, I've got my two electrons. I'm done. That's my Bohr model of helium. And if you know about this first little level of electrons, you know that it's full when it has two electrons. Well, that's a full valence shell. So what does that mean? This is a stable atom. Now, that stability means that it will be relatively non-reactive. It doesn't need to, or want to, so to speak, share any electrons, or gain any electron electrons, or lose any electrons, because its valence orbital is full. So what that means is that this particular element is probably chemically inert. What does that mean? It means it doesn't want to react. The whole point of reacting is to either you know, gain or lose or share electrons. Let's look at fluorine down here in contrast. Here's my atomic number for fluorine. Uh, 18.9984032 is my atomic mass. So what does that mean? It means that I've got nine protons. And it means that, well, this is really close to 19. So that means I'm going to have, in most forms of fluorine, 10 neutrons. And if I'm going to make an atom here, I better have an equal number of electrons to protons. So I better have nine total electrons, which means two electrons in the first level and seven electrons in the second level, because two plus seven is nine. Now, let's look at this in contrast. You can kind of see that I left a little gap there for space to draw in another little dot. Please recall that the first level, four electrons, is filled when it has two electrons, but the next level is filled when it has eight electrons. This particular second level for electrons only has seven. So what that means is that we have a valence shell that isn't full, or a valence level, as the case may be, um, or we could call it a valence level, valence orbital, valence shell, whatever. It's the places where electrons hang out. So this is, in, this is not stable. Which means that it's probably chemically reactive. So what's going to happen? Well, we'll talk about that in a couple slides from here on. At this point, what I'd like you to be able to do is be able to predict atomic structure of any element on the periodic table um, up to atomic number 20. So uh, you should be able to draw Bohr models of hydrogen all the way up to Bohr models of calcium. Of course, our most important elements in biology are going to be hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, phosphorus, and sulfur. All right, those are our most important elements. So we really need to understand the atomic structure of those six for biology class. The reason why I want you to be able to draw Bohr models of atoms for any of these elements is because I want you to be able to predict how it might or might not gain or lose electrons or share electrons, as the case may be. Let's get some definitions down here in terms of types of bonds. We've talked about this already. Chemical bonds form when atoms share 
or transfer and then subsequently become positive and negative ions and then they're attracted to one another as a result of that opposite charge. Covalent bonds. Let's look at this word. Covalent literally means two valence levels together. It's kind of like the word cohabitate. You cohabitate, that means you live together with your family. Covalence is a similarly structured word, and so what that means is that um, covalence literally means intersecting orbitals. And as you can see from the diagram down here in this covalent bond, really these outermost orbitals from these two different nuclei are really merging, and so you get one covalent level because the electrons really zoom around between all these different places in both of these, what were independent valence levels, and now together they're called a covalent uh, shell. So when pairs of electrons are shared like that, we call that a covalent bond. When electrons um, are transferred from one atom to another, what you're going to get is either negative and positive ions. So um, negative ions, which we call anions, are attracted to cations. Cations are positive, anions are negative. So what does that really mean? It means that it's not, it's not actually the transfer itself that creates the bond. What creates the bond is the attraction between the oppositely charged ions that result from the loss and or gain of electrons. Now there's a special property we're going to talk about later called electronegativity that's going to help us predict which elements will either lose, gain, or share electrons. But we'll address that later. Let's talk a little bit more in detail about ionic bonds. I think it's useful for you to draw a Bohr model of the sodium and chlorine atoms and think about how it is that each atom would become most stable with a full outer shell of electrons. And I have a diagram here that I think it's useful for you to look at. Here's a sodium atom. Notice that it has one valence electron. And if you remember from the statement earlier, that would be an unstable situation. And more than likely uh, thing for it to, to do to become more stable would be for it to just literally take this electron, not take it, but lose it, I should say. So this electron is literally going to go away. And the result is that that third level where that electron was is essentially gone. And now the second level is the new valence level. And now that valence level is full. So according to our rule that we stated previously, this sodium ion is more stable than this sodium atom because this valence level, which you know used to not be the valence level, but now it is, is full. And it's important to recognize that sodium would have 11 protons because it's sodium. Whether or not it's an atom or an ion, it still has 11 protons. That's what makes it sodium. And because there's 11 protons here and a total number of 10 electrons, we have an inequality in number of protons and electrons, and it is that inequality that results in a charged ion. We've got 11 positively charged particles, 10 negatively charged particles, so we have a positive charge. So if I'm going to ever ask you to draw a Bohr model of an ion, it is important that you draw the charge that uh, results from the inequality between protons and electrons. In contrast, if you look at a chlorine atom, you'll notice that its valence level, which is the third level, has seven electrons, much like the fluorine atom that we drew earlier has seven valence electrons. And it's unstable in that situation because that valence level is not full. What will happen is it will find a way to get an electron. And when it does so, its valence level will be full with eight electrons. Well, what does that mean? It means that there's a total number of 18 electrons, but this is still chlorine. It's actually called chloride now. That's a funny little chemistry thing. We change the ending of these words sometimes when uh, atoms become anions. The endings of the words will sometimes change from I-N-E to I-D-E, ein or een to eid. But the thing to realize here now is that with a total of 18 electrons, we still have 17 protons. So 18 electrons and 17 protons results in an overall negative charge. Now, 
What's a little bit misleading here is that it's showing that the electron has to come from sodium and be transferred to chlorine. That could happen, but the thing to realize is that this sodium atom could give up its electron to any other atom that would accept it, and this chlorine atom could get uh, an electron from any other atom that would donate it. The atoms that bond together are not necessarily the ones that are transferring directly electrons from or to one another. The bond actually happens as a result of the attraction between this positive ion and this negative ion. All right? The bond is from the electrostatic attraction between the oppositely charged ions, and that's what this statement is all about here. What's interesting to note <clears throat> is that it isn't just one sodium ion that's going to bond with one chloride ion. They really sort of group with one another and form a 90-degree uh, angle in all dimensions, all three dimensions, relative to one another. So you have chloride ions being surrounded by sodium ions, and you have sodium ions surrounded by chloride ions. And if you notice, these bonds actually are made at right angles relative to one another, and it is those bond angles on the interior molecular crystalline structure of this whole grouping that results in the outer shape of salt crystals, which themselves are cubic. So again, if we think about going from atoms to ions, I want you in general to understand that atoms with three or less valence electrons will tend to lose them and can become positive cations. So for example, if we look at this neutral atom, and the reason we know it's a neutral atom is because this little thing is an electron, this little thing is an electron, this little thing is an electron, and we've got one, two, three protons. So I know it's lithium. This is another Bohr model for lithium. One, two, three protons symbolized in red here. Three electrons total. That's a lithium atom. Here's my lithium atom again. The fourth neutron is not shown in this particular diagram. If this loses an electron, the result is that it becomes a positive ion. And it's important for you to know, a little bit of vocabulary term here, a positive ion is known as a cation. And that's easy to remember because cats have paws. So cats are positive, <laughs> right? <clears throat> In contrast, atoms with three or more, um, oh, you know what? This number should be five. This is a mistake, guys. Sorry. Atoms with five or more valence electrons tend to gain more electrons and become negative ions as a result. So here's our fluorine atom. And now, you know, not all the stuff is drawn in the middle. Remember, we had nine protons here. We had 10 neutrons. And there was a, there's another electron orbital. Oops, there's another electron orbital, an inner orbital that had two electrons. So here's these seven valence electrons. If it gets another electron from anywhere, now we have a full valence shell, so it's more stable. But there's an imbalance in numbers of protons and numbers of electrons. This would be nine protons, but 10 electrons. So nine protons and 10 electrons, what that means is we have an overall negative one fluoride ion, all right? Covalent bonds, and there's two types of co covalent bonds, are happen, uh, happen when electrons are shared. Now here's the thing, sometimes, just like kids, some atoms are really good at sharing really, really fairly. Um, but sometimes, just like kids, they're really not good at sharing fairly. When you have what we call a nonpolar covalent bond, that happens if the electrons are shared equally. So this is what we call uh, a nonpolar covalent bond, or just a covalent bond, all right? So this is nonpolar covalent bond. And if you notice, if these x's represent electrons, as indicated by the key here, they're shared relatively equally between these two yellow circles, which represent two separate, uh, what used to be two separate atoms. This down here is representing a polar covalent bond. So a polar covalent bond, that's what happens if the electrons are not shared equally. For whatever reason, this atom seems to be better at grabbing onto electrons than this atom. This one's just being unfair with the uh, electron sharing. 
Well, let's talk about why that can happen. <clears throat> And we will address that later, but before we do that, it's important to understand this idea of valence. All right, Ooh, let me go back to that slide. Valence happens to be the number of electrons needed to fill the valence level. also happens to um, be the number of chemical bonds that an atom can form. Now this is actually going to be covalent bonds, all right? Generally what you do is you're going to calculate the valence number, or not the, the valence number, the valence, by subtracting the number of valence shell electrons from eight or two in the case of hydrogen and helium. It helps you predict formulas. Um, I know, for example, that the valence number for hydrogen is one because it needs one more electron to fill its level. And I know the valence level for chlorine is one because it also needs one more electron to fill its valence level. And so it'll make one covalent bond. 